Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this podcast, episode eight of Keynote. And today we have the immense pleasure to have Dr. Jill Golensil with us. Hi, Jill, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Awesome. I'm halfway across and, the world. <laughs> yeah, I know. You are based in Washington, D.C., in the U.S., and I'm currently based in Singapore, so it's really like kind of across the globe, which is really representing also the spirit, you know, of Keynote, which is empowering women worldwide through public speaking and to have more women on stage. So that's really representing really perfectly the goal, you know, that we want to achieve. And so today we have a very yummy and interesting topic for all of you. We are going to speak about empowerment through geostrategy and risk management. So we know that the title is a little um, scary and really a lot of few words, you know, a risk and geostrategy, but with the help of Jill, you're going to see that everything is very smooth and it's absolutely a pleasure to navigate through risk and through this very important notions. And sometimes we have a very uh, scared mindset around them and we should, we should not. So first, let me introduce um, uh, in few words, you know, myself. So my name is Aureli and I'm based in Singapore. I'm currently working in Microsoft, where I'm managing the team doing fraud prevention and detection in Asia. I moved to Singapore, in fact, 16 years ago, but obviously you can see I'm French. So it's kind of also a mixed culture and uh, I decided indeed to um, visit the world. Um, so my expertise is basically is really in risk. I was working in insurance, in HSBC, in a lot of banking institution uh, for doing all kinds of risk, market, uh, credit, etc., cyber. And I just landed in Microsoft three years ago. I'm also a very active supporter for women professional development. I'm part of the Primetime Network for the past six years. I was a president for two years and I'm still a board advisor. And as you might know, Keynote has been created in the Primetime and now it's flying by its own wings. Um, and so this uh, very absolutely immense honor to be here today and to continue you know the work from this women empowerment network this community that we have built across continents and and seas and to be all together in this mission of empowering women uh, on stage so now let me really introduce the guest speaker for today our amazing dr jill golden seal so Jill has really a lot of expertise as you will see in terms of international law international security geopolitical risk, leadership, human rights, and migration and disinformation. So she worked with a lot of United Nations officials, world parliamentarians, and senior military leaders. And she also did a lot of speaking alongside with some major political person like Angela Merkel, and uh, all the world leaders, especially at the intergovernmental conference to adopt the global compact for migration. So another achievement for Dr. Galenstiel is that she lectured 1,200 US and foreign field grade military officers on the law of war, international law and migration. And this was at the Marine Corps University, if I'm correct, Jill. And you were also teaching like 200 officers in seminars on law. So it's pretty kind of a big, you know, um, achievement and program uh, sharing all these topics, you know, in front of military and, uh, and people in the Army Corps. You're also an affiliated scholar at the University of Pennsylvania's Fox Leadership International Program. And uh, what we really need to highlight also nowadays is your Forbes contributor on defense and national security, which is really also seating your expertise in this field. Um, you also appeared on top scholarly journals and you're really quoted quite often and seated in the press uh, all around all this topic around geopolitics and risk and migration and immigration of flow. So you, you have a PhD and uh, AM in government from Harvard, congratulations, and a GD from NYU and a lot of other diploma, including the AB from Princeton. So we are sure that we are in good hands with you to discuss about this very uh, spiky topic, you know, about geopolitics, but also especially about risk. And uh, without further ado, but before, just hold on one second. Can you tell us something which is not in the bio, you know, that we picked up from LinkedIn or, or like something, can you share with us something that we will never imagine or we don't know from your, your resume? 
so first of all, thank you for that very generous introduction. I feel like my entire career just flashed before my eyes and um, only the best part. So I really, I really appreciate that. I, I'm so, uh, so glad to be here and to be in conversation with you because I think our, our perspectives really complement each other. Something that people don't know about me until they meet me and then they might figure it out quickly, depending on the context, is I'm just not afraid to speak uh, truth to power, although that sounds very confrontational and it's not necessarily, but it doesn't matter how many eagles, stars, feathers you have in your cap, you wear on your chest, I'm willing to speak up in meetings and tell you if I don't like something, if I think something's not going to work. I'm also willing to put myself out there and tell you what I don't know, because I think the most important part of being an expert, um, the most, it, it's the most critical part of being an expert is knowing what you don't know. And if I'm not willing to put myself out there and be vulnerable and say, you know, I'm an expert in migration, mm. but there's this whole area I, I haven't explored and I'd rather you tell me about it because you're the expert in it. Um, or if I'm not asking the questions and taking the time to really understand a problem, then I'm first of all, not doing my job, but secondly, I'm not creating the environment for other people to express their vulnerabilities and to express that, yeah, there might be flaws in their plans. There might be more risk than they, than they were willing to talk about before until I did that. So that's, that's really great. Say. And I think that's really also demonstrating a lot of courage and bravery because people will be so much intimidated, you know, with like stars of a general or other, like you, we were seeing this in your bio, you know, you were speaking next to Angela Merkel and a lot of other world leaders. So it's really demonstrate also how, you know, we all have our self doubt and how you manage to go overcome them and to speak up and to be brave around all this area. So that's really also a very good role model and example. So thank you, Jill, for that. Um, so let's talk about geopolitics and uh, geopolitical risk. And then after we will move a little about a broader overview about risk management and how does it mean and how we can be stopped being scared, you know, about the terms. So focusing first about geopolitical risk as over the past few years, you know, we saw this movement migratory in Europe and then we saw a lot of different movement also in Asia and we saw the tension between US and China for so many, uh, well, almost years, you know. So we will, we understand that geopolitical risk is the number one global corporate risk but we hear the terms but we don't really know what does it mean so can you help us to understand in more like Lehman term why what is geopolitical risk why it is so important and what does it comprise so i define geopolitical risk very broadly and i define it as the probability that any political event or geopolitical event can significantly impact a, a business. And so that can cover really anything from Greenpeace deciding to have a protest that disrupts activity in a port one day to air, international airspace being closed because of a suspected terrorist event to an earthquake affecting say Haiti or, uh, or the Caribbean in general or somewhere in somewhere in the ring of fire. So it, it's a broad, broad term, but I think it being broad really forces people to think about all of the global types of risks and different types of risks that can significantly impact their business operations. That's um, a very good, I would say, summarized definition indeed. And um, as we see now with a wide definition, you know, all the tentacular impact that this notion of geopolitical risk can have, what would be then your advice about to corporate leaders, you know, to say how they can effectively mitigate this risk? And what is your vision based on your experience about how to change this risk into opportunities? So there's two, uh, two parts to that question, uh, probably a million parts to that question, but I'll start, so I'll start with the second part first. So when I worked on the Global Compact for Migration at the UN, one of the things that we really stressed in terms of what civil society was involved in, which I was a part of representing the Academic Council uh, on the UN system, we really stressed not just 
managing the risks of migration or managing the potential harms of migration or protecting sovereign borders, but also the opportunities that migration could provide in terms of development, in terms of immigration to countries that are having declining populations, in terms of enlivening communities and adding diversity. So, and that was, I think, a really huge contribution that civil society, mostly some states as well were interested in this, but civil society mostly made to the dialogue over migration. And in the end, the Global Compact has 32 objectives, and they they cover both the the benefits and the and the burdens of of migration. There had been this dialogue before that that migration was a burden, and that states should engage in burden sharing for refugee populations. And I think we've worked really really hard to change that, and that's been helpful with a lot of the political backlash that's been involved and been been very negative about migration and it's helped with with hatred in society overall and with any kind of risk is the same type of thing right it's important to look at the positives and the negatives and what can come out of any particular risk or any particular disaster whether it's some tragedy forcing a corporation to build relationships in a community further and those relationships end up being better for the company's operations for the long term to rebuilding after rebuilding after a natural disaster i mean nobody nobody wants a natural disaster it certainly is a is a geopolitical risk particularly in places where earthquakes are common but perhaps the rebuilding process can be better for a corporation's bottom line in the long term and their and improve their relationships in the in the community overall so it's always important to think about both sides not just what what a risk is and how do we mitigate it, but what a risk is and how do we turn it into an opportunity as well. And then in terms of really breaking that down, uh, so I have a framework that I use when I advise on geopolitical risks and I call it PREM2, which is a little bit of a silly acronym, but it makes it easy to remember. And it's problem framing, research, analysis, mitigation, testing, and then updating and implementation. And I put the last two together because updating is the number one thing that corporations don't do and that makes risk management plans fail. Um, but uh, what to answer your question, I think the, the key is really the problem framing. And what that means is figuring out, first of all, well, what risk are you trying to mitigate? What problem are you trying to solve by creating a risk management plan? Are you trying to brainstorm all of the risks that could possibly affect your business operations anywhere in the world? What time frame are you looking at if, if you're doing that? How, how are you going to develop a plan to mitigate that? Are you trying to figure out what part of a, what unit of a company is best positioned to deal with risk management or you're trying to deal with a particular business decision. If I open a factory in a particular neighborhood or in a particular country, what is, what is that going to mean? So it's, it's really important to figure out how to frame that problem. That's your first step in breaking it down and then to revisit it because maybe it's a different, when, when you dig into that research, the next step or that analysis, the step after that, you discover that you've got a different problem than you thought you had. And so then you need to go back and reframe the problem and figure out, okay, well, what didn't I, what didn't I get before now that I had to change the problem? What do I, what more research do I need to do? What more analysis do I need to do? What do I need to, need to answer? So that's, that's the first, awesome. first step. Yeah. And so um, when you think about how many steps did you say there is in this framework? Six. Six, perfect. And you were saying the acronyms is? PREM2. PREM2, okay, perfect. So before we go into detail you know, about these steps, because I think we really, really want to know what is, af what is happening after the problem framing, there was okay. something I believe which was really, really important and I wanted to kind of focus on that when you were saying, you know, taking the example about the migration and the problem you know, related to the flux of people and nobody wants to put their hands into that because they only see the problem which can be happen. And how did we, with a risk management approach, you can take an issue, a problem or something where people think it's stinging so much that nobody wants to take care of that. And you really mix it and change it into opportunities. I think something you really said, which was excellent, and we really need to keep that in mind, you know, if all of you are listening as corporate leaders of our future is about 
not being impacted by the first view of things, but really, as we're saying, taking the problem framing, really doing an assessment and seeing exactly which are the different impacts, but how you can twist them and how you can frame them and how you can put them into a positive output instead of having, you know, a negative impact. And for every corporation, you know, when we speak about as a corporate leader, launching a new product, having, you know, um, attrition issue or um, developing, a new, you know, implementing our business in another country, the same principle apply every, every, every time that we're seeing, you know, this, uh, the sixth step. And the first one is indeed starting with this problem framing. And as we're saying, revisiting, which is really interesting because when we were in, you know, in banking and other regulators, they have this very fancy name to speak about risk management principle and framework. And you need to do this um, very huge you know, document to have this every step by steps. But the principle are always the same, which is assessing, understanding into the time frame, or what is your appetite in a way, what would be the different impact and how you can mitigate them. And the key word that I wanted to just highlight before we move to the next steps is really about revisiting. People would think that doing risk management is when you assess something one time and you just fix it or you implement something and then that's done. This is the biggest mistake that people can do. The aspect of life and work and cooperation, you know, energy and geopolitics are always changing. And so the framework needs always to be reevaluated. So we're in cooperation that's like twice a year and you have a bunch of people coming next to you at your desk and say, oh, what are the new controls we implement? When in fact, you need to be really more dynamic. But that's something that as a takeaway, you know, first takeaway, I will say after the problem framework is also make it dynamic. It's never ends and it's never frozen in time or in, um, in space. So that's uh, one thing, you know, I wanted to highlight here. So you gave us a very good teaser with this problem framing. What is a step two? <laughs> Step two. So first of all, I, I really like what you said. I think it's important to think of these six steps as not linear, but more of a circle because, and, and I, I'm not sure there's a shape in existence, but it, that it really is because you always have to be going back and revisiting. Mm. Updating has to be continuous because a new law could be passed the next day and it's going to change all of the all of the risk that affects your organization, change a lot of it, obliterate something that thought was a really crucial part of your analysis. You have an earthquake, a new election of a, of a particular political leader. This can all be a tremendous impact. And you can certainly identify points as you go along in your research and analysis where, OK, we need to keep looking at, say, the legal and regulatory framework. I'm a lawyer, so I'm always going to go back mm -hmm. to that. But uh, and how this how this needs to be. And we need to look at this particular thing needs to be updated. but really you need to at regular intervals you know take a look at the world and certainly before you implement it which is why i tie update and implementation you need to take a hard look at well, how do things look that day in a situation like an earthquake things are going to be evolving minute by minute day by day certainly in a war as well just as quickly so you need to be thinking about all right well what is the context at this moment that i need to consider in order to make the best decision exactly. of what is the what is the context of this risk but so back to the framework. So problem framing, then research. So researching yeah, yeah. the problem once once you framed it, trying to figure out who, trying to figure out the the key the key player. So this is a, a place where I, I the best framework I find to start with is the five W's because most people know what that is: who, mm -hmm. what, where, when, why, and then I always put in how as well. So who and what, who are the stakeholders, what are their interests? So who is gonna be impacted by any particular business decision, if say, if say that's what you're, uh, how you framed your problem? Um, who's gonna be impacted? Or what are the parts of your business that are, that are gonna be impacted? Who are the people in the local communities that are gonna be impacted? How is any particular state's economy gonna be impacted if you, if you invest, invest there? Um, anything like that, uh, figuring out the, the stakeholders is part of the who and then what are their interests okay well what are the people in the local community worried about there are they worried about jobs are they worried about pollution are they worried about some something else in terms of culture so that those are all things things to consider are they worried about you know, pollution downstream or impact to their family structure with lots of people lots of foreigners coming in all things to think about and then there's the where. Okay, so where is where is this investment being made? Where is this decision going to impact? 
So local, regional, national, maybe even more fine grained in terms of neighborhood in a, in a particular city. All right, well, what are the risks inherent to these places? But also what are the risks if we build a factory you know, to, um, to the region, to the state overall? Maybe we might be polluting a river that's gonna run downstream to the next state and that's gonna affect international relations between the two states. And we better be thinking about that as we, as we build or in our decision whether to, uh, whether to build in the first place. Mm. And then what, why? Why is it affecting these people? Why is it going to have particular effects? Is there, yeah. you know, when we get to the analysis, maybe there might be a way to mitigate that as well. So then uh, um, analyzing all of that. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what that means, what the what the probability of certain risks is, what uh, what the risks are as the, given the, the way that the problem is, is currently framed, figuring out what to do with all of that data you gathered in the research stage, mm -hmm. and then mitigation. So mitigation plan development figuring out, all right, how do we mitigate these risks? And this is a place where, again, what sometimes people miss is, all right, well, what, what are the potential opportunities as well? How can we turn some of these risks into a benefit? Maybe this has started as we've done the research, gone to the place and started to interview members of the local community already. Maybe we can start leveraging those relationships into something that will, that will be mitigation in, in the longer term. And then, Here's the important thing that people also miss, testing. You gotta mm -hmm. test the plan. And that has to happen since I work for the military at the strategic operational and tactical level, right? So overall, is this fitting into your overall business strategy? That needs to be considered as you're going through implementing your plan, testing your plan, but also um, who's, down to the technical level, who's going to do it? Who's going to be your your first responder, so to speak? Yeah. What? Uh, who are you sending out in front of the media? And this mm. might be particular units, but it also might be you know, depending on the size of your corporation and the personalities involved. It might be particular people. I mean, maybe there are particular people that would be better to, to bring out in front of the press in particular situations, uh, or who are more more savvy in person than they are on social media. So very tactically it's important to to think about what will happen this is a place where it's really important to have you know outside experts figuring out the other things that could go wrong because a lot mm -hmm. of times people in organizations are engaging groupthink and they don't always think of things that can go wrong they don't know what they don't know and then there's update and implementation um, so have that plan in place, have it ready to go, but also make sure you're revisiting it and updating it all, all the time, um, as frequently as, as frequently as possible, um, depending on the, yeah. on the particular risk and the time frame. So, um, so there, that's the framework. <laughs> no, and it's true. And, you know, if you speak to any people who have spent some time in doing any kind of risk management in any organization, we will totally feel that. And which is interesting is some people in some organization will like structure a whole risk management team and they will put like a label on it and they will say, yes, this is a job of the risk manager to do that. When in fact, it's not. It's the job of everybody who is involved at every level of an organization for the decision process. And this is not rocket science. This is like just, just what we call just common sense and principle. You have a situation, you research the different parameters, you analyze them, you assess if it's going to be okay or go with the direction you want to take. So you need to know where you want to go. And then you see, well, if this is not going to really help me to go in the way I want to go, what can I do to support it? Or what can I do to mitigate the negative impact so that I can just like grow on it? And um, that's something that really amazed me, you know, like how people think this is so complex. And so like, we need to have framework and we need to have fragmentation and we need to have like expert. I'm not saying we don't need to have experts. We need to have people like you to explain to people who think this is so complicated, but also, I mean, geopolitical risk is also so narrow and so niche that you need to have also this expertise depending on the country. And we need expert in risk management, depending on the type of risk we're covering. Cyber, of course, like geopolitical, we need like product. Or if we speak about doing like a marine import export business, we need this kind of people. But as a leader, and if there is one takeaway that I believe you and I, Jill, we want also to share 
share here is like people should not be scared by speaking about risk management. You might not understand as being a leader exactly the content, but that's why you pay expert like yourself, you know, to provide it. But at least the framework is something that we can all apply. And another very interesting concept also is people usually have a whole ways they suspect of risk equal bad things or running away. And which is interesting, and this is something which is really anchored in our DNA and in fact in our the part of our primitive brain you know which is the one protecting us for all these millions of years which is we don't want to put ourselves at risk because we want to be safe so the first human reaction we have in our brains like risk is like, ah, i'm not going to go there that can kill me or that can damage me or that can damage my business so i would just back off and i will be so risk adverse that i will put a lot of controls and check etc and i think what we would like to see uh, you know, this is one podcast, but then there will be a lot of different talks and there is a lot of people having the same mindset is when people understand how to apply the framework you are defining, you know, these six steps, whatever is applied also in different corporation. This is how exactly like the yin and the yang. This is where you take a risk and something negative and you just switch it into something which is boosting you, your power, boosting you, your business, boosting the opportunities and boosting a country, you know, when you were helping the army, when you were helping leaders to understand how to switch from a problem with immigration or a flu of people to how we can integrate that in the population, how we can have a positive impact on the economy. This is how things can flow. So that's something which is absolutely amazing to see how people sometimes are reluctant. But the question I will have to you is, well, this is I'm feeling passionate about that because this is my bread and butter for 16 years. But for you, you know, when you also speak through a legion of different people and you speak with different leaders and different corporation, you know, how do you see that risk management is really empowering organization leaders and, you know, in general, just purely people? I think it's important for leaders to recognize and they, they do in, in some sense that risk is going to happen. So then what do you do about it? Do you see it as bad and you mitigate it or do you turn it into, do you try to turn it into some kind of opportunity? Can you see what's positive in it or what positive opportunity it, it can bring out? So that's, that's really what's in, empowering, mm -hmm. being able to see any risk as some sort of, some sort of opportunity as well. And it's, one of the, when I've been reading about risk recently and one best practice I read about was bringing out both the risk management team and the corporate social responsibility team to assess a problem together. Yeah. And the, they're going to see very different things when they, when they look at a particular problem, but they can also work together to turn risks into, into opportunities in a way that I think neither could alone. And that was really, that was really interesting to me. Of course, not every company has that, but what yeah. they can do is look at, is bring people in from the outside, bring in outside experts to analyze a problem in a, in a different way and think about mm. what opportunities could come out of it. Exactly. You know, it's how you can really bring different perspective on the same topic. Um, this is when something that people forget is how the delegating to somebody who is going to do your risk assessment on them wrong because the person will know the risk the best or the one facing the risk every day, the one doing the work, the one who are at the bottom, you know, sometimes of the pyramids just doing the work really, and they will know what risk they are facing every day. So, um, so that's going back to the principle of saying, well, in a way, everybody should be a risk manager and then you have risk experts also will help explain you to go deeper on some topic, but everybody should have a mindset. And so, you know, we, we, we speak about these different tools and the different framework and um, we're speaking a little about this vision, you know, that risk is, it can really empower, empower organization. And I would say, you know, as a, as a last question for this podcast today, it's like, well, do you think that in fact we could switch from a corporate world to just purely the human world like in fact is risk management just part of us and part of being you know human and how we can take away as learning for our private life and careers by using it on a day-to-day -day? it's part of what we do every day and if we think about it that way maybe it will be a little less scary so uh, this is an example from your ted talk actually but brushing your teeth so <laughs> 
most people brush their teeth every day, or at least they hope they do. And they're doing that to avoid the risk of getting a cavity. And we don't think about that in terms of risk. We just think of that in terms of general hygiene, but that's what it is. Traffic lights, stop signs. Well, there are plenty of places in the world that don't have those. Um, they're put there by the government to minimize risks. We could let drivers just make their own decisions at every intersection, but we as the government or we as a society have decided that the risks are too great. So we have traffic lights and stop signs there. And most people don't think those are a bad thing. I imagine there are some, but most people think those are a, those are a good thing overall. So risk management can be very simple. It could be one of those things. And that's very analogous to some of the decisions that need to be made in business as well. Risk management can be very simple. You just need to understand the problem and frame it and come up with how to do it in a way that people will accept. Mm. Exactly. And and the example of the of the toothbrush, in fact, that was also coming, you know, from from somewhere like when you know, every day when you drink your tea, and in fact, I realized I was starting to take my cup of tea at the beginning of the talk and I totally forgot it after. But when you want to drink your tea or your coffee, you always like taste it before you're going to take the risk of burning yourself. So which is interesting to see if our brain already has some automatism, you know, about when you leave your home, you lock your door because you don't want people to burglar you. When you're going to drink your tea, you test the heat because you don't want to burglar you. And which is interesting is how this automatism or something that we are blocking our brain to accept for decision we want to take in our life. And it can be corporate decision, it can be career decision, it can be just like human decision, you know, like, do I want to get married? Do I want to jump career? Do I want to uh, do this and move country, you know, because I want to do that and that. And um, something I know we were discussing offline, you know, when we were preparing this podcast is people don't really have the reflex to do this pro and cons list. And doing a pro and cons list is the best risk management tool you can do. And it's something which is really less elaborate than what we can see in corporate work, but the output is the same. Your list, which are the different impact, what decision can have on yourself, depending on your own risk appetite, depending on your direction. And um, your brain will do the work and then it will work. So it's really, you know, we say that the brain is really just like a muscle and we just have to train and to exercise so that we don't lose neurons and we have some mechanisms coming into the picture. And I think what we understand also from you today is about this simply six step, you know, the framework, how we can move this into of course the corporate world, but also how we can move to just our day to day family, personal life, and just to practice and to be sure that we take them the right decision. That would be awesome. You know, a world when we all take right decisions. <laughs> and anybody who has engaged in a pro con list and many, if not most people have, as weighed probability yeah. like, probability doesn't have to be a scary word it doesn't have to yeah. give you flashbacks to high school math it's really just you're that's exactly what you're doing you're assessing whether the pros outweigh the cons you're not mm. calculating a decimal place you're just thinking about all right well do i want a more than more than b the alternative so um so it's it's natural. I mean, I'm thinking of my son learning to walk. One, one yes. of them anyway was very cautious about it. He saw the risk of falling. So it's something that it's innate that we all live with. And it's important to just think about, all right, this is something risk happens. Um, mm -hmm. And so what are, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to mitigate it? And then how are we going to, going to, take the opportunities of it in bungee jumping, jumping off a, uh, jumping off a yes. cliff or a building that that's really risky, if not worse, but, uh, now that we put it on a bungee cord, it's fun. So we're <laughs> taking advantage of <laughs> that. It's so funny. Them. Yeah. Because all well, the funny story. So Keynote, you know, started in Singapore. And when we started this program, I was so lucky to be part of the first batch of public, you know, the training program. And then at the end, we had to do like a, a ceremony and a judge in front of everybody. And my talk was how you can use risk for your day to day. And like, for example, swimming with sharks. And like some people find swimming with sharks is totally risk less because there is a cage, but other people will see all the risks related to the cage falling and then the mechanisms, you know, like being stuck. And so this is where indeed your appetite and your understanding um, is totally different and it's totally um, unique. And that's why it's coming back to you. And 
the pro and cons when we have some people coming to you and I'm pretty sure Jill, it happened to you. People say, what should I do in this situation? Like, tell me wh what do I need to do now? It's like, I'm not in your shoes. I cannot assess what is your own risk appetite and risk assessment. Do you pro and cons? I can help you to guide, you know, where, where do you want? But this is, um, uh, this is, you know, the work that we have to do. So yes, but I mean, thanks so much, Jill, for your time here. That was absolutely an enjoyable conversation, uh, really you. fluid. And I love the way that we write from like very heavy topics, you know, about <laughs> migration and worldwide leaders and geopolitics, but how you know it's also moving them to a corporate environment when in fact, there is no magic recipes. There is very simple six steps to apply in every situation with sometimes different degrees, different experts, different inputs, but also something we have all of us to keep in mind is how we need to use it for our personal life and teaching also to our kids or even to our parents if they don't understand that, you know, when they were telling you, you cannot go out after 10 p.m. because it's too risky. So, you know, it's how, you know, we can take decision on a day to day, which are based on facts, assessment and without emotion first but just really reflecting on that so before we close the podcast uh would you have like one summary good guidance one advice you know to the people who are listening to us update and bring in outside experts so one thing i've really learned from the military working for the military is the problems of groupthink because I'm working with people who have been in a particular organization and in a particular mindset for anywhere between 10 and 25 years. And they're good at recognizing that they have problems with group things sometimes, but they're not always good at remedying it. And the way they do it when they're doing military planning is bring in what's called a red team. Mm. And the red team, I was told the best people for red teams are the people who don't have military backgrounds, don't think like military at all. Like bring in the anthropologists to mm -hmm. deal with the, the lieutenant colonels. And that's because they think so differently that they're immediately gonna see holes in a particular plan, operational plan that the military never would. And mm -hmm. most organizations, particularly large ones, but really all of them do have a problem with groupthink. So it, it is really important to bring in people from the from the outside to understand and then updating, but we've talked about that already. That's awesome. Yeah, updating, bringing different perspective and thinking. That would be indeed like the main three keywords I would say. So thanks a lot, um, Dr. Jill, yeah. you know, to have a join us for today. Um, really appreciate your time and all the inputs you know you have shared in the stories and thanks to all of you who have listened to us um, don't forget to go and to check in on our keynote website when you will find amazing profile of different speakers on different topics um, we have permission we need to bring more women on stage and we have a one the world amazing profiles among our members um we can talk about anything <laughs> we really cover different type of roles and the thing that we really want to encourage is each of us as a story each of us has something where you're unique for and you have something you're passionate about and this is going to be your way to just speak up be brave and shine for all your personal life and career life if it's something you want so don't hesitate to reach out to our website and um we're always here if you have any questions and I will close the podcast now. It was such a pleasure. And my name is Aurélie. Thank you so much, Dr. Schill. And Thank have you. a good evening. Bye-bye.